Um, several years ago now, the, uh, Will Ferrell starred in a movie called uh, Talladega Nights. Um, I haven't seen the movie. I've only seen uh, bits and pieces of it. Um, and nor do I, you know, I don't recommend Will Ferrell movies, so don't go home and get the, you know, the family together. Um, I like Elf, though. I've told you, you know, Elf is one of my, is one of my favorite uh, Christmas movies. But, but there's a scene in this movie where Ricky Bobby is played by um, uh, Farrell, who is sort of this stereotypical NASCAR driver. He's not all that sharp. And he sits down to pray at, uh, at the dinner table. And um, there's a, uh, the prayer is really, really strange because he prays to tiny little baby Jesus. And he says, he, his prayer goes something like this. He says, uh, dear tiny little baby Jesus, with your tiny little hands and feet and your tiny little manger, watching your tiny little Einstein videos, use your tiny, tiny little superpowers to keep me on the winning track. Amen. That's his prayer. His wife, who's not much sharper than that, she's a little bit offended by that prayer. And she says, well, you're not supposed to pray to the, uh, in the name of baby Jesus. You're supposed to pray to grown-up Jesus. And Pharaoh said, well, uh, he, he gets a little defensive. He said, well, when you pray, you can pray to whatever Jesus you want. You can pray to teenage Jesus. You can pray to adult Jesus. You can pray to bearded Jesus. I like to pray to tiny little baby Jesus. I like Christmas Jesus the best. And as goofy as that is, and, and admittedly somewhat funny, but it's, it's, I think a lot of people do the same thing, right? We, many people prefer Christmas Jesus. We, we, we like a, a, a little baby. He's not nearly as offensive, maybe not nearly as threatening or nearly as demanding. Some of us like sort of part-time Jesus, right? Just Jesus to sort of show up when we need him. I mean, just like if, if I need you, I'll call on you. You come in, swoop in, fix my problems, and then I'll let you know if I, if I have another issue uh, down the road someday. Uh, some of us like, like you know, like that. Or John Orbrook said, we've got a tendency to replace the real Jesus with whatever Jesus we want him to be. And, but the real Jesus isn't just a historical figure that we sing Christmas songs about. He is Lord. He is God. He is the line of Judah. He is coming again as we just sang about. And because he cares for us and he loves us, and he proved that by dying, right? Dying, he, he saved us. He wants us to experience abundant life until that, time, that day comes, until he calls us home or until the Lord comes again. But we've been saying now, you got to take a different path. There's a different path. That's what this series is all about. This is a series that began just uh, at the beginning of the new year where it's just a call to be different, a call to be weird. And so we've talked about time and simplicity and what that looks like. We talked last week about uh, spiritual growth and putting ourselves in a position to grow spiritually. Um, today, we're going to talk about money. And uh, in fact, we're going to talk about money over these upcoming weeks. And and for some of you, you hear that and you're like, oh man, really? We got to talk about money? I mean, you know, we, I, do we really have to do that? But, but I want you to understand that roughly uh, 15% of everything that Jesus said, it had something to do with money. He talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. He talked more about money than he did prayer. If I were to do a sermon series uh, regarding like the parables of Jesus, that like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if I were just to go and, and teach through the parables of Jesus, there's 38 of them. That, uh, 16 of those sermons, 42%, are, are devoted to the topic of money and or possessions. So we're getting off easy, right? We're getting off easy. I, I'm just going to do, uh, I think, three probably is what the plan is. Now, uh, I, I, uh, I looked back, and it had been over 10 years since I'd preached consecutively on any type of uh, series as it pertains to money. I, I was meeting with our um, uh, elders and deacons to, at the end of last year, and we were just talking. I just said, hey, what do I, like, is there anything that you can sense that our church needs as we come in this new year? What do we want, we want to talk about? And one of them said, hey, well, you haven't done that pie illustration in, in quite some time. And if you've been around for a long time, it's probably, I think it's been like five years since I've done that. Uh, that tends to be one of the most well-remembered uh, uh, messages or at least illustrations. Uh, the message will be a little bit different, but illustrations. So uh, I plan to do that next week. But, but the reason that Jesus talked about our possessions and finances so much, because he knew they would be a major part of our life and that they would either be a potential pitfall or a source of blessing. 
And, and that's what I want us to see today. I, and, I, and as we go through this, and, and again, we're going to look at this from different angles as we, as we go into these, in these upcoming weeks. But, but I want to pick up today in Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to be in verse 14, and, and, and we're jumping into a, a time in which Jesus is he's been teaching a lot. This is the end of his life. He's getting ready to go to the cross, and, and there's these series of parables and teachings that, that he's leading into before he dies. And he's talking about the kingdom of God, and he's talking about, well, again, what we just sang about, his, what it's going to be like when he returns. And so look at verse 14 uh, in Matthew chapter 25. It says this. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. Uh, so also the, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, uh, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the man who had received one bag of gold uh, came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. And so I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I haven't sown and gathered where I haven't scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Now you can see why someone would, like, would, you know, would want to think about tiny little baby Jesus instead of that guy, right? I mean, that, like, that, 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 that's, there, there's something powerful about that. I mean, Jesus, and there's something really uncomfortable about this, truth be known, right? As Jesus is talking about uh, these money managers, um, like, there's, there's just some shocking words in some ways. But there's important truths for you and I to learn here, as there always is, as we learn from Jesus and what he has to say in our life. In fact, I think there's three important truths. But before we get there, I want us to focus on one little word in this parable. This is the one we need to highlight. Back in verse 14, he says the, the little word is his. His. See, Jesus is talking about God here. And so the first thing that we have to come to understand as it pertains to uh, property, the, the property owner, it's God's. It's his property God is the owner, you and I are the managers. We're stewards of what God has given us. He owns it all and he has the right to tell us what to do with it. Now, now maybe you can see why that fits into a series like this because that alone is weird. That alone is strange. Well, what do you mean that it belongs to God? Uh, and, and I think truth be known, church, if we could just all be really honest with ourselves this morning, I think all of us would have to confess that greed is in our hearts more than we want to admit or realize. Right? I mean, it, it just is. I, I use this illustration often for a variety of different reasons, but uh, uh, let, me just, let me just say it again uh, in, in a little bit of a different way. Think about those babies, and we have so many precious brand new little babies in our church we're so thankful for, and 
And, um, and we thank you as new parents, like my little baby, like he or she, they're never going to have a crossword. I mean, they're going to, you know, it's going to, but, but as we like, as they grow up, we know that's not the case, but the very first words is usually mama or dada. And, and then the next word is what? Usually no. I mean, you know, they're pretty quick to go to no. And then the next word, typically the f- fourth word maybe is mine, Right. And so that's why the first fights we have to break up in the church is not in a boardroom. It's not on a ball court. They're in the nursery, right? I mean, they're mine, right? I mean, this, this is what kids do, right? I mean, it, this, is, this is just the way it is, right? There's just something in us. Like, we're just this sinful part of us. Like, we're just selfish. We're greedy. Like, we, again, this is why it has to just take the supernatural work of God to change our life, right? But this is the point that I want us to catch today, that I want us to catch all throughout this series, is that God owns it all. God, as it pertains to everything that we have, God is the owner. And since God owns it all, uh, let's let's learn some lessons from this passage. First, we've got to be be grateful. Be grateful for what God has entrusted to us. Now, the master in this story represents God, and he's entrusted his property to three different servants, and those three servants represent you and me. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5 says, naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and, and uh, so as he departs, he takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. You and I were born with nothing, and uh, if we live, you know, on, on average, maybe 80 years, and uh, we're going to leave with nothing, right? The things that we have, that they're, they're just on loan. Uh, they're, they're, they've been temporarily entrusted to us. Now, I know the pushback is this. Well, what do you mean? I worked hard for this, these, the things that I have. I clocked in. I did the work. I put in the hard. Listen, all those things are true, and you should be applauded for, for working hard. God gives us, like, there's nothing wrong with that. God's wired us to work. But, but to say all that's mine just simply isn't true. Who gave you your mind? Who gave you your body to earn the money that you make? Who opened the door for that job? Uh, allowed your business to grow? Who, like, who let you be born into the family that you were born into or the uh, country with an economy that, that does well? Who got that job? Who made it possible? It's God. Everything that we have is from Him. And I think, again, we, we would maybe affirm that, and we would want to at least affirm that, but it's so easy to forget. And I think this is maybe why Jesus, one of these things that, you know, Jesus wants to remind us here that, uh, that uh, you know, to, to not be ungrateful. Um, but the truth of the matter is we always want more. <laughs> we, always, we always want more. Um, I think it was Bob Russell who sort of illustrated it like this, and, uh, and, and much in these, these money series, uh, I, I know I've learned a lot from him. And he says it like this. He said, imagine that because of certain circumstances that, uh, you've not been able to go on vacation for maybe a year or two. Money is too tight. You just can't go. And then you get a text or a phone call from your uncle. Your uncle has done really well for himself. He's got a beach house. He says, hey, listen, I've got a beach house. It's available for you such and such date. You can take your family there. Go relax. Have a great time. It's all yours. Well, you would obviously be thrilled and excited. And so you take a trip and you go to the beach house. But when you get to the, to the beach house, you flip on the light and you realize that the, the light bulb's burned out. And you're really hungry because it was a long trip. And you go to the refrigerator and you open up the door, but the refrigerator's not stocked. Well, you go to lay down on, the, on your bed, but the pillow's kind of a little bit lumpier than, uh, than yours at home. And then you, uh, you step out, out on, the, on the porch and you realize, you know what, the, the ocean's a little bit further away than I kind of imagined, right? What are you going to do? You're going to fire off a text or call your uncle and say, hey, you need, to, you need to make these things right. I need food in the refrigerator, a better pillow, a light bulb change. No, we're going to be grateful. You're going to be grateful. You don't even notice those things. Why? Because you're not paying for it. He's taking care of those things. You're using it. He's allowing you to live in it for a while. We're going to be grateful and appreciative of our uncle's generosity. That should be our perspective in life. God owns it all, and he allows us to use it for a period. And so we should have an attitude of gratitude. Maybe that is helpful for us to, maybe it would be helpful for us just to acknowledge throughout the day that everything that we have is God's. In fact, I, I'd encourage you to do that sometimes. So in the morning, right, you wake up and you get out of God's bed. 
right? And then you go to, uh, into God's bathroom and, and you turn on God's shower. And out from God's shower head comes God's water. And then you go and put on God's clothes and, and you walk into his kitchen and you eat his cereal and, and you drink God's coffee and you read God's newspaper, right? And you get in God's car and then you go to, uh, go to God's job and, and then you come back to God's home, right? And you turn on God's TV and you cheer for God's team, which happens to be the Kentucky Wildcats, right? <laughs> Amen. Um, but... <laughs> Right, Steve? Um, but you go through the day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, it, Tennessee fan, you know, we, we, there's a lot of, lots, of, lots of love there. Um, but, but you go through the day, right? And we acknowledge everything, everything's, everything belongs to him. And when you, when you acknowledge that it belongs to him, right, it's a, it puts our heart in, in the right place. And, and so instead of focusing on what we don't have, we're appreciative of what we do have. Second thing that we see here is that to be content. To be content with the things that God has entrusted to us. Notice from this parable, God doesn't evenly distribute his resources. Right? And so you and I have to be content with the things that we have. Right? It, this master gives uh, one servant five bags of gold. Literally, probably talents. Maybe that's what your, uh, your, the, the, your version may say. Right? Um, to another two talents. To another just one. A, a talent was a measurement, okay? And so a talent was, uh, it could be a, a worth up to approximately 15, maybe even 20 years of income for a day labor. And so let's say that you have a job and what is used round numbers, it pays $50,000 a year. And so one talent would be worth $750,000. Two talents would be worth a million and a half. Uh, five talents would be worth nearly four million dollars. Now, maybe people would look at this, uh, this the parable that Jesus tells and says, you know what, it would have been fair to give everybody the same amount. Why didn't Jesus just give everybody two or three or five or one? That would have made things a little more equal, right? Then you could sort of distribute it like, but God doesn't operate like that. Right? And, and we know that. Same is true in our life. Right? It, it may not seem fair always that, you know, that they get to go to Hawaii on, on vacation, but, but you don't. Or that they're, you know, there's, they, someone always drives a newer model car than you. Or, or, or that their home is twice the size of ours. I mean, equality, like it seems more biblical, right? I, I wonder if this one talent man, he, he looked at the fact that this guy had got five or the other guy got two and maybe he became discontent with his one and so that's maybe the reason he just buried it in the ground i don't know but i do know that at times you and i do the same we at least do that right we're constantly looking around I, i've told you this multiple times right that comparison it's the enemy of contentment comparison is the enemy like if you want to sure find a surefire way to be discontent with the things that God has given you then you just start comparing what you have or don't have with what other people have I went to, to one of my buddy's church a few years back and uh, went into his office and his office he had a uh, big office and he had a bathroom and a shower in his office and I thought well, why don't I have a bathroom and shower right I mean, you could do that, right? You go into someone's home or you see someone's car, right? It's so easy to, uh, to, to, get, to be discontent with what we have. But I'm learning, and I bet you are as well. I'm still learning. And it doesn't matter how many talents you have or you fill in the blank. Whatever area of discontentment you find yourself frequently in, there's always somebody that's got more. I mean, it's like if, if you're... Like, contentment's a moving target, right? It's, it's a moving target, and, and as long as you're comparing, and as long as, especially like if it's money or, re, you know, some of those things, if you're, like, if that's the goal, you'll never be satisfied with more stuff, right? Or more anything. It moves all the time. I mean, it's, it's a moving goal. I mean, I think, I think most of us would probably affirm, like in a place like this day, like, you know what, as it pertains to money and, and wealth and riches, you know, I ain't, I, I ain't you know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay, I'm not trying to get rich, but then, 
But then that Mega Millions is like, whoa, that thing is high, right? Or that Powerball is way up there. And you're, you're thinking, you know what? I know what rich people have said. They're saying money can't buy you happiness. Well, they say that because they're rich, right? I mean, they, they already say that. Or what's that, old, that, that country music song? Uh, you know, uh, uh, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy it can buy you a boat, right? It can buy a truck to pull it, and you know, you know the song, right? You go, you go right on down, go right on down the line. But the, the truth of the matter is, money does buy you happiness. I mean, let's be honest: driving a new car off the lot that makes me happy, right? I mean, building a like building your dream home. I, that's going to make me happy. Going to Hawaii on vacation, <laughs> that's going to make me happy. But, but the problem is what? It's a mirage. It's a moving target. It, it, like it, it, it helps for a, like for a while, yes, I'm happy. Like, but then, like, and we swear, I got this new car I'm never eating in. And then, you know, we got french fries in the floor. You know, just a, th- you know, and a year later, like, you know what? I'm not as happy as I thought I was, right? We, we, we think, well, if I can just get this, if I can pay this off, if I can just, like, achieve these things, then, but it's not permanent. And so what do we do? Well, yeah, I built that, or I bought that, or I, I achieved that, and, you know, so now let's go for something else, right? And we start this mirage all over again. And we're looking for happiness like that. How different would our life be if we just simply went by this passage of Scripture of Hebrews that says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with, with what you have. One final lesson is this. Be intentional with what God's entrusted you. Be intentional with it. Be intentional. We, we'll be grateful. Uh, we're content. But we've also got to be Intentional. It's not about how much you have, it's, it's what you do with what you got. All right, that's what this story tells us, that's what this Jesus parable reminds us of. And, but not only that, but there's a truth here that we have to take a look at. And this is sort of the sobering part of this parable, is that Jesus says we're going to be held accountable someday for the things that he has given us. And so we need to be intentional, whether they are big or small. The two of those servants go out, they double the original amount that they had been given by their master. This third guy buries his talent in the ground. He does nothing with it. And did you notice what Jesus, the master, talking about God, calls this man that buries this money, this talent in the ground? He calls him a wicked and lazy servant. Now, I, that's to me, that's unusual to pair those words together like that. I, I don't know about you, but I don't always think about uh, laziness and wickedness together. I, I mean, this guy, like, it does, like, like, it's not like he embezzled the money, right? It, it's not like he wasted the money. He didn't just go buy the latest gadgets on the late night television infomercials. He didn't waste the money like the prodigal son. He didn't just go and just squander his wealth. He didn't steal like Zacchaeus did. He buried it. But Jesus said that's it's a major problem. And he said that, that, that he's going to be judged not because of something that we do that's bad, that we waste it or steal it or embezzle it, but because we don't do anything with it. See, we're, we're to be intentional with the things that God has given us, whether it's our time, talent, uh, any resource that God may have given us. He calls us to be good stewards. Now, don't just bury it in the ground and wait for Jesus to return someday. No, we're we're working, we're serving, we're giving, we're loving, we're intentional with what God has given to us. And so, let's go back to where we began. Jesus makes it clear that all of this belongs to God. That it all belongs to God. And so the question is today, is that how different would your life be if you lived with that constant reminder? How different would your life be if you lived constantly with the reminder that, hey, what I have, it's on loan, it's temporary, it's God's ultimately, and I'm here to serve Him until He returns or calls me home. Chip Ingram, is a, a, he tells a story about a time when he was a, a young pastor in Texas, and, and uh, his, the church, uh, the chairman of the elders at that time, his name was a guy, a guy named John Seville, 
And he took him out to eat. He took him out to a really expensive restaurant in, in Dallas. And, and Chip knew that John had some money, just didn't know how much he had. Turns out he had a lot. And uh, they sat down and to share a meal. And after the meal was over, John said, Chip, I've got a proposal that I want to make you. Uh, I, I, have a, uh, I have a desire, and you have an opportunity. He said, I want us to make a deal. And so he pulled out a checkbook, and, uh, and he explained to Chip that God had blessed him with the ability to make a lot of money. But he said that he explained that he hadn't become a Christian until later on in his life. However, he wanted to use the money that God had blessed him with to make a difference in the, the lives of people. He wanted to be able to show the love of Jesus. And so he, but the problem for him, he had a company to run. He was super busy, travel. Uh, his time was really limited. And so he said, Chip, I, I want you to take this checkbook. And it was labeled Pastor Discretionary Fund. And John, he said, John, uh, and John said, if you see someone who has a need, I want you to meet that need with this money. If you see someone hurting, I want you to uh, show them the love of Jesus with this money. He said, I just want you to ask this one question. John, John said, I just want you to ask of this money. Ask Chip, what would John want me to do with this money? And so Chip took that checkbook and he went home and, and every day he would put that checkbook in his pocket and, and as he... Uh, was doing ministry, he would, uh, would walk around and say, well, what would John want me to do with this money? And every few months, they would get, to get back together, and Chip would sort of just tell John stories, how he helped a runaway teenager, how uh, he helped someone uh, with their electricity get back on for a family, just different stories like that. And he could see the, the joy that it began to bring John. And then he started to be excited about spending their time together. So Chip would be really uh, strategic about the resources that he had and using them that way. And, and he began to learn John's heart. And over time, he began to really look forward to their time of accountability because he was so careful with his money. He said he wasn't nearly as careful with his own money, but this was John's money. And so he watched every penny that it went because it belonged to John. And then he said something happened, something unexpected through the process. He said he and John formed just a great relationship. They came him really, really close, basically becoming the best of friends. And I think this is a great picture of, what, of, of how this works for you and me. You and I, we are God's money managers. And it's not overly complicated. We sort of do life, walk around and ask, okay, well, how would God want me to, to spend this? How would God want me to use this? Where does he want me to invest? What does he want me to do? And I hope you understand that for us as a church, this isn't about getting something from you. This isn't about manipulation. Uh, I, I mean, if I was going to try to do that, I would take the offering after a message like this. But that's not the case. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. We want you to see the, the, the beauty of, of surrendering your life to God in every way, including sometimes the way that seems most personal to us, and that is uh, our, our finances. And so that's our, our challenge. How are you using what God has given to you? See, the reason that Jesus talks so much about money is because it's an issue of our heart. And for some today, maybe this issue, this is the very thing that's holding you back. And you're like, you know what? It's not worth it. Like, I can't. Like, God, listen, you know, we're sort of like the, you know, the, the, the rich young ruler. We'll read a little bit more about him in his upcoming weeks. But, like, there's something that we think, well, God, like, what is it? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's something else. God, again, doesn't need your money. You know what the Bible tells us about God and Israel? And it's just a, little, just a little way for us to think about it. It says, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Right? It's not about needing some. He wants you. He desires you. And not just part of you. He wants all of you to trust Him. To be led by Him. Even in our, the things with our resources, and again, we'll get more specific in these, in these next two weeks as we talk about money and spending and, and all of those things, but God cares about you. And um, that's our challenge. Like, he just challenges us, just trust me with this. Trust me. You're my child. I love you. Trust me with this. So, see, this parable, 
and all the others in this section that we, that we were reading about, they're announcing the same thing. You can go home this week and read you know, the end of Matthew. They're all announcing the same thing. Jesus is going to come again someday. Uh, we're going to stand before him someday, and we're going to give an account. Now, the deal is we're all going to come up short. Uh, that's why Jesus came, right? We're, we're all going to come up short. There ain't none of us in here that's done this perfect. Uh, we, we won't do this perfect, okay? And so that's why we need Jesus. But we're going to stand before the Lord someday, and we're going to have to give an account of, like, of, 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 of all, right? But because of God's love in our life, but because of Christ, because of the, the Spirit of God indwelling us, because of the change that He's made with us, now we look forward of opportunities to serve and to love and, and to give. And we think, okay, God, what, what, what would you want me to do? Now we take the narrow path. It's strange. It's odd. It's weird that we would say, God, I'm going to give you all of me, not just part of me. Lord, I'm going I'm to trust you in all of my life. Not just saying, hey, God, give me your salvation. I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to give you my all. But our prayer and our hope is that because of Jesus, not because of any great, wonderful things that we've done, that we're going to stand before the Lord someday, and we're going to be able to take the things that he's given us, our time, treasure, talent, resources, and we're going to be able to hear the same words that Jesus, uh, that these men heard from their master. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. I've entrusted you with a few things. <laughs> now, like now, you can, you're going to be able to enjoy even more. It's all God's. He owns it all. He's just saying, hey, get, trust me in every part of your life. Let's pray together. Father God, we, um, we know, Lord, how easy it is to hold on to the things that we have. Lord, we know that, I mean, money, it just, there's, it takes money to live. It takes money to survive. It takes money to to, to do the things that we desire, Lord, and so it's hard to let go of those grips. But God, may we trust you with every part of our life, including our, our resource. And Father, may we truly, truly uh, live in a manner someday that we're using those for your glory and your good. But God, I pray if there's any here today who are holding on and holding back from trusting Jesus maybe for the first time in their life that today that grip would loosen and that Lord that they truly would uh, look to Christ for uh, new life God thank you that our ultimate hope is in how well we do and um, with uh, our, our performing our uh, just the living our life and our deeds God but just that we're trusting Jesus with all things. God, we love you. And we pray for those who are here or watching online, Lord, that, that uh, we could trust Jesus in every way. We ask this in his name. Amen. Let's be standing.